We are streaming to you live tonight from the city of Ottawa, which is built on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. We would like to honor the peoples and land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation, Miigwech. We would also like to honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, their elders, their ancestors, and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. We encourage all of you to do the same wherever you're listening from. Tonight, we have invited Safe Wings Ottawa to talk about the reasons behind the city's new bird safe design guidelines and how residents can make their homes safer for birds. Willow English has studied birds in many places around the world, and she's currently pursuing her PhD at Carleton University. I'm not sure if you'd say she was roosting, perching, nesting there currently. All sorts of puns could be made. We also have Anouk Hudeman, who's the founder and coordinator of Safe Wings Ottawa with us. Willow and Anouk were both very helpful to city staff during the development of our guidelines, and they have a wealth of experience and knowledge to share with us tonight. So I would like to, at this point, invite Willow to start screen sharing with us and uh, take it away. Thank you. All right, there we go. Thank you very much, Amy, for that introduction. So I'll be talking today about just the basis of the problem of collisions. And I'm gonna be explaining how we can solve the problem, all the methods that we have, and what we can do as individuals and what SafeWings has been doing. So first, let's start with the numbers. Now, 1 billion birds are thought to collide every year in North America alone. But to me, that number just really doesn't seem meaningful because it's so big. It's only when I see birds spread out like this that have been killed by collisions. And this is at one of the Safe Wings yearly displays back when we could have public displays. You know, that, that really hits home. Um, and this problem is, is one of the biggest problems that faces birds. Uh, we have about 7,000 collisions per year at one of the worst buildings in Ottawa. And when you compare that to wind turbines, which many people think of as uh, a problem for birds, they kill less than 1 million a year in all of North America. So it's a really major problem that we need to address. More specifically in Ottawa, in 2020, SafeWings volunteers uh, and the public recorded over 4,701 collisions. And this is actually only a very small portion of the birds who collide in Ottawa. We don't monitor every building in the city. I think you'd be a little worried if we were wandering around outside your house. Um, and even those that we do monitor regularly, we think that we only find about five to 15% of victims. And we'll go through the reasons for that later. The estimated total in Ottawa is at the very least 250,000 birds per year, which is huge. And it's not just common birds that are colliding. We've uh, documented 144 species, and I think many of you would probably be surprised to learn that Ottawa even has 144 species. But we've also had individuals of 14 species at risk. So why do we have this problem? And the answer to this is based on our love affair with glass. Glass has become one of the cheapest and most desirable uh, building materials recently. And we've seen changes in the design of buildings from at the top of the picture, a single residential home to uh, condos or apartments on the right hand side to office buildings on the lower left we've really increased the amount of glass in the environment. As I mentioned, it's not just common birds that are colliding, it's a huge diversity of birds. I mentioned we had just over 4,700 birds collide last year in Ottawa, and a big group of that was the warblers. We had over a thousand warblers collide, and these are these small insect-eating birds that tend to migrate further north and breed in the boreal forest. We also had uh, over 500 native sparrows, 
And I say native because I'm differentiating from house sparrows, which are introduced. Chickadees, they're here all year round. They know the area very well, but they still collide. Uh, we had almost 300 thrushes, which are birds like robins. Kinglets are birds, uh, they're very small, and they tend to travel around in large flocks. And we actually documented uh, a collision event where we had over 60 of these birds hit a single building in a single day. Because when you travel in a flock, you hit buildings in a flock. We had over 200 woodpeckers, 166 nuthatches, uh, 38 raptors, including owls, so that's basically birds of prey. We had 46 individuals of species at risk, so either these are species with uh, small numbers or declining populations. And we also had a number of birds that you might not expect to collide, such as the turkey that you can see pictured here, as well as ducks, shorebirds, and cuckoos. So you may be wondering, okay, 250,000 dead birds a year, why don't I ever see them? Well, there's a number of reasons. We have a very effective uh, group of scavengers here in Ottawa, from crows to foxes, uh, to coyotes, to gulls, but birds also, when they hit, can fall in areas where you just don't see them. They can be hidden in vegetation. It's pretty easy to overlook a hummingbird in long grass and they're often moved aside or discarded. One major thing that I will be uh, talking about later is that a lot of birds who don't immediately die from a collision fly away and die elsewhere. So they may not be seen near the building where they hit. Now when birds collide, most of them do die immediately or very soon after, but it's a bit of a myth that most of them are dying from a broken neck. In fact, it's head trauma. It's basically like if you ran full speed at a, a brick wall um, and collided head first. And birds are doing this a lot faster and they have very thin skulls. Now those who don't die immediately uh, tend to have injuries such as head trauma, but also things like internal bleeding or vision loss. And these injuries may be too much for them to survive either because of the injuries themselves or because they prevent them from finding food or escaping from predators. Why do birds matter? Well, I know I just feel that, that birds have an intrinsic value and I like seeing them and hearing them, but they're also extremely important to our environment. They're responsible for things like pest control and there's actually been a number of studies done where they've excluded birds from areas of timber and found that the timber quality decreases. So it's a huge economic incentive to keep birds as well. A turkey vulture uh, is one of the few animals or any way to remove botulism toxin from the environment. And hummingbirds are responsible for pollination. Birds like the waxwing in the upper right eat lots of berries containing seeds. And when they poop out, uh, the remains, they disperse those seeds across the landscape. Birds are also important as a source of food for other wildlife and also for people. North America is also unfortunately losing its birds. A recent study uh, by colleagues at Environment and Climate Change Canada found that North America has lost almost 3 bil uh, billion birds, and these are adult breeding birds since 1970. And uh, collisions with glass is one of the leading causes. The leading cause is actually cats, or the leading cause related to humans is actually cats. But many birds that cats uh, attack and kill are actually have collided with a window first, and that's why they're on the ground. So in order to uh, be able to stop collisions, we need to understand why birds collide. And there's two main reasons. Uh, glass is an invisible hazard for birds, so they don't really understand it because it's not there in the natural environment. Birds have a problem with transparent glass. Basically, when they can see through to the other side and they're trying to get there, they will attempt to fly through it. But they're also fooled by reflections. So a bird seeing a reflection of a tree in glass thinks that that tree is real and will attempt to fly towards it. So let's go through some examples of transparency that you might see from day to day. 
glass walkways are almost always a problem for collisions unless there's been uh, treatments done to prevent them. The top one here is at the National uh, Gallery and you can see how birds will obviously know that they can't fly through those buildings but if they're trying to get to the other side they think that they can go through that glass walkway to reach the trees. It doesn't need to be a, a three-story glass walkway either. In the lower panel you can see uh, just a single glass walkway that is also a problem for collisions. Now glass railing panels are something that every person who works with collisions absolutely hates and basically these just uh, have a lot more glass in the environment because they're so popular these days but a bird trying to fly to the other side perhaps because you have a plant on your balcony or in the lower case or in the lower picture uh, because it's in the middle of a marsh uh, they don't understand that there's glass there and will just collide. Indoor vegetation is also an issue when you, birds can see through windows. In the lower picture, you can see that it would be very difficult for a bird to understand that some of the plants are on the outside there and some of them are on the inside of the glass. So having plants close to windows where birds can see them can be very dangerous. Now this cause of collisions is maybe a bit more subtle, but it's basically when you have a corner of a building or any other structure where there's glass on both sides. And birds are trying to take a shortcut and they can see through that corner to the other side and they can, they can collide. And this is seen more and more as we have glass, more glass in buildings. Now these examples I've shown really aren't, aren't all the, the examples of transparent glass. In the landscape, we can find things like these uh, stairway panels, as well as even something like a smoking shelter or a, a bus stop. So anytime you can see through glass to the other side, it can be a potential hazard for birds. So let's move on to reflectivity here. And reflections are basically of the trees or sky and birds see them as real so they attempt to fly towards it. And it's important to remember that all glass is reflective in certain conditions. Some glass is more reflective than others. Uh, you can have mirrored glass, which is usually worse than very transparent glass, uh, but you know, all glass can cause reflections and therefore collisions. If you look down at the bottom left, you can also see that sometimes glass can be both uh, transparent and reflective at the same time. So you can see um, down here on the bottom left, you have a tree that's being reflected, so that can cause collisions, but you also have a corner with glass on both sides where a bird might try and fly through. Now, we are going to be focusing mainly on glass because that tends to be uh, the material that has these properties most often, but it's not the only material like this. So polished metal, as you can see in these uh, garage doors, can be a problem if it causes reflections. And as I'm sure you've seen, we're, we're getting more and more plexiglass in the environment with COVID as people are trying to uh, separate from other people, and this can also cause collisions. So I've mentioned both transparency and reflections as reasons why birds collide, but sometimes people just tell us, you know, it's doing it on purpose. It's not because it doesn't know that it's there. And this is often found uh, in male birds early in the, in the spring when they're very territorial, their hormones are raging and they see a reflection of themselves and think, that it's another bird, a rival that they can try and fight and get to move from the area. So this is actually a shorter term problem because once the hormone levels start decreasing, uh, they tend to start leaving their reflections alone, but you can easily stop this just by covering it. And you get this sometimes in mirrors that are unlikely to cause uh, a collision, but something like a car wing mirror, uh, birds tend to attack early in the year for this reason. So now let's move on to what makes buildings lethal. Now I'm sure uh, if I asked all of you, okay, which of these two buildings, Parliament or this building out in Canada, uh, which one is worse for birds? I'm sure most of you would know that it was the one on the right, but there are certain characteristics 
um, that make it especially so. So if we compare these buildings, we see a lot more glass and a lot more reflective glass, highly reflective glass on the one on the right. We see more uh, vegetation around it as well as a water feature. And these are all characteristics that mean that there's more likely to be collisions at the building on the right. But first, let's dispel a myth about collisions. A lot of people have heard about collisions at these all glass skyscrapers. And while these are a problem, uh, they're not the main problem. In fact, uh, while there's some uncertainty about these numbers because it's just very hard to document, it's thought that low rise buildings like the one on the left here are actually responsible for more than half of collisions and residences are responsible for almost the rest. And this is related to the fact that birds tend to collide quite low down on buildings, usually at the height or below of where there's trees. And so at the top of a skyscraper where there's not as much to reflect, you're less likely to have collisions. Now the first indicator of whether a building is going to be dangerous for birds is simply just the amount of glass. So you may recognize this building in the upper left uh, by Dow's Lake, and it's got these huge wraparound windows as well as these glass railing panels. So this building, because of the amount of glass, is likely to be dangerous to birds. Similarly, we have uh, the example in the lower left where you have a lot of glass and you can also see through to the other side. We can also compare uh, the amount of glass and the amount of collisions in the two buildings on the right. We have many fewer collisions at the one that's closer to uh, the whoever's taking the picture simply because there's less glass there to reflect. The environmental context is also important. If you took the, the house from the top and moved it to the area at the bottom where there's very little in the way of trees or vegetation, uh, you would have many less collisions than if it is where the picture shows it. Uh, similarly, if you move the house from the bottom up to the context in the top, you would have more collisions. And it's not that you need a forest surrounding a building in order for there to be collisions, because even a single tree can make a difference. You may also have more birds in an area than you would expect based on the amount of green space, because birds can be drawn to areas uh, that you, you wouldn't expect them in because of light pollution. And I'll be going over light pollution in a bit more detail later. Design traps are, are a really um, interesting feature that, that can be harmful for birds because you basically have uh, an area that has glass on multiple sides and vegetation lures a bird in and then it has trouble leaving either because it's surrounded by reflections on multiple sides or because like in the upper picture, uh, there's these parallel lines of walls on either side and it funnels the birds towards a hazard. So you can see at the uh, right here, if you can see my cursor, this looks like a way for birds to leave this courtyard, but in fact, that's entirely glass. Similarly, in the picture at the bottom, uh, we have uh, a a alcove where birds can see through to the other side. So any bird that reaches this area between these two wings of the building is likely to collide as it moves through and tries to reach the other side of the building. Now bird attractants can also increase collisions. Basically, if you have more birds around, you're also going to have more collisions around. And bird attractants can include things like bird feeders, uh, natural food sources like berries or other fruiting trees, vegetation, and also water features, whether they're a bird bath or something natural. So it's important if you're drawing birds into your yard that you make sure your yard is safe for them. Now, of course, I, I mentioned I'm mainly uh, talking about collisions, but because the Ottawa Bird Friendly Design Guidelines uh, touch on a few other things, I thought I would include some other potential dangers to birds that you should be aware of. Now, the first is uh, guy wires, and these are used to hold up things like towers or antenna, and they can be very dangerous to birds simply because they're hard to see and birds are moving very quickly. And I've unfortunately found several birds that have had a wing sheared off because they hit a guy wire at such speed. 
So it's best if we can avoid guy wires through designs that don't require them, uh, but we can also work on making them more visible to birds. Now, window wells are something that people may be aware of as a danger to uh, animals like mammals or, or amphibians, because how would a bird get stuck in here if a bird can fly? But a lot of birds, uh, when they first leave the nest, aren't very good at flying. And we tend to get a lot of calls um, in the spring when we have fledglings, so young birds who can't fly well, uh, and they get stuck in these window wells. And this can be solved by either preventing the birds from getting into the window wells or having an easy way for them to get out. Open pipes, flues, and vents are also a problem. Uh, and this is because many of the birds in Ottawa are what's known as cavity nesters. And cavity nesters are birds that nest in a, a natural hollow, usually in a tree. And in urban or suburban environments, there's often not a lot of large trees that have holes in them for the birds to use. So they look at man-made sources instead. Now, in contrast to a tree hollow, which is very rough on the inside, a pipe or a chimney is quite smooth. And so a bird may have trouble uh, getting out of it. And that's why it's important that we cap these off to prevent them from getting in. And you may think, okay, well, that explains uh, the chimney topper and the pipe there, but what about the gazebo? The gazebo actually reminds me of a, a story that I was told by a friend and they had bought one of these and there was a little hole at the top of each of the legs. And that hole was just big enough for a chickadee to look into and chickadees are one of our cavity nesting birds. And they ended up lifting up the gazebo at the end of the year and were horrified to find a stack of dead chickadees in several of the legs. And this is because the chickadees went in to look and couldn't get out. So it's important where you have little holes in into uh, small tubes to make sure they're blocked off to prevent birds from going in. Mesh uh, is often used to prevent birds from accessing things like balconies, as you can see on the lower left, uh, but it's also used to prevent birds from getting into things like uh, berries, um, but it's not the only, only um, reason it could be used. Something like a, a soccer net uh, can have uh, mesh in it. And these can all trap birds. This is especially the case if you have holes in them where birds can kind of get in and then get, have trouble getting out. Um, but it can also be because the mesh is not very taut. So we recommend that you don't use mesh unless you absolutely have to. And if you do need to use it, then you keep it in good repair and check it regularly to make sure there's nothing caught in it. So I mentioned before a light pollution and light pollution uh, affects birds mainly because many birds migrate at night, especially some of our smaller species. So birds who are migrating at night navigate by the stars and the moon. And so when there's bright lights from human sources, uh, they get very disoriented and it can cause them to behave in ways that are dangerous to their health. And there's two main uh, different types of light that can do this. So bright lights, really bright lights like a searchlight or like this uh, picture, which is showing the 9-11 memorial, um, basically draw birds in like a moth to a flame. And the birds who are trapped in these uh, bright lights will just circle aimlessly until they collide or they simply fall with exhaustion. And at this uh, tribute, they actually have observers who make sure uh, when they get a certain number of birds trapped in the light that they're turned off and, and it allows the birds to disperse. And you can actually see the birds in this picture. They're all the little specks. So it actually is very striking how many birds, especially during the migratory period, that can get trapped in a single light in one area. But it's not just bright lights that are a problem. Uh, city glow, which is basically the lights from everything from cars uh, to stores to houses, um, can cause birds to go into areas where they might not normally go. And these birds aren't necessarily colliding at night. They're getting drawn to an area. Uh, and this is a big problem in downtown Ottawa as well, as well as other parts of Ottawa. But they get drawn into an area. And then in the morning, uh, they realize that this is not a great place for them. And they try and leave. 
uh, only to collide because there, there's usually uh, lots of glass in areas with lots of light pollution. Now, what can we do about light pollution? Now, first, it's important to consider the fact that there's been a number of studies finding that having more light or brighter lights doesn't actually reduce crime or increase human safety. And part of the reason for that is if you're standing in an area of very bright light, you're unable to see uh, in the dark around it. So you're less able to see your surroundings. So we need to keep in mind that we need to limit our light. And, and that we may not actually be getting the results uh, that we're trying to get with having more light. The color of the light is also important. Uh, birds and other wildlife tend to be less affected by warmer light. So that would be the left-hand side uh, of this picture at the bottom and more affected uh, by the, the harsh white lights on the right-hand side. It's also important that we uh, design both indoor and outdoor lighting to minimize the spill. So you can see in these two, two uh, light fixtures, the one on the left has light spillage both upwards and outwards, where the one on the right is focusing the light downwards, which is the only place we really need it. We can also control lights with motion sensors and timers to make sure that the lights are only on when we actually need them. And while you know, we have a big city here in Ottawa with lots of lights, so you may think, you know, my lights don't really make a difference, but even just turning off a single porch light at lights at houses across the city could make a difference. So let's talk now about preventing collisions. How do we do this? Now, the easiest way to prevent collisions at buildings um, is to prevent, is to make the, the buildings bird safe to begin with. And the easiest way to do that is to have bird safe design guidelines. Now, these are basically uh, rules that are given to architects or developers that tell them what they need to do to make sure that the new buildings that they're building uh, are safe for birds. Now, we have this uh, bird safe design guideline uh, in Ottawa now, which is great news. Um, unfortunately, it's not mandatory, and that's something that we would love to see. So cities like Toronto do have mandatory bird-friendly design guidelines, which means that all new buildings have to follow this and, and uh, make, make themselves safer for birds. So that's something we'd really like to see in the future for Ottawa. Now, in areas that don't have bird-friendly uh, design guidelines, they can also, people can also use guidelines that are a bit more general, such as the Canadian Standards Association guidelines, and these are all very similar and they outline um, what characteristics buildings need to have to prevent collisions. Now bird friendly architecture sometimes gets a bad rap. We're not trying to say that everyone needs to live in a windowless box. These are all examples of bird friendly architecture and you can see that uh, inside they would have lots of light and they're using things like bird friendly glass which I'll speak about shortly but also uh, these slats on the upper left or frosted glass on the lower right. Um, some of these you might recognize. The one on the upper right is from Ryerson, while um, other ones are from across the globe. So in order to have bird-friendly buildings, we need to use bird-friendly building materials. And one of our biggest uh, bird-friendly big building materials is bird-friendly glass. And this is basically glass that has a pattern on it. And that pattern tells the bird that there's something there. So you can see that there's lots of examples of this. Uh, the upper right here, you might recognize this is the Rosemount Library that was recently renovated. And this little uh, reading nook was put in. And it's hard to see in this picture, but the pattern on that glass is actually uh, letters of the alphabet, which is uh, very appropriate for a library. We can also see examples here of these wavy lines um, and a mixture of both frosted and clear glass here on this door. Things like these bricks of glass uh, can give enough texture to prevent collisions, but bird-friendly building materials are not limited to just types of glass, but can also be things like these railings in the bottom left that don't have any glass in them and actually help protect birds from the windows behind them. 
Now, bird-friendly glass can come with lots of different patterns, and you can see some examples of patterns that are available on the right-hand side here. But the patterns need to follow uh, specific guidelines in order to be effective. And these can be uh, divided into three main groups. So the first is the spacing of the pattern. And the spacing needs to be a um, maximum of about five centimeters between uh, pattern uh, objects and a minimum of six millimeters in diameter of the pattern. And all of this needs to be on the exterior surface of the glass. And that's because if it's on the interior surface, uh, when the glass is reflecting, you can't see the inside. It also needs to be in a high con contrast color. So if you have a dark tinted glass, having a black pattern isn't very helpful. Now, why is density so important? Well, let's look at a contrast between glass that's designed to prevent people from colliding, which is the bottom here with these uh, four lines across, and glass that's designed to prevent birds from colliding, which is the one on the right. Now, when a person looks at the glass on the lower left, they're going to see, okay, there's glass here. These lines indicate that there's glass throughout this entire area. Whereas birds don't understand that about glass. If they see something in one area of the glass, they will avoid it, but it doesn't prevent them from colliding with other areas. And so we have to make sure uh, that there's um, very little spaces in between because birds are used to trying to fly between obstacles like branches with very little space between them. And I mentioned before, bird-friendly glass is not the only way to make uh, buildings bird-friendly. There's lots of other examples of integrated features such as the grills, uh, these slots on the upper left, things like metal screening and, and shades uh, on the bottom. So these are just some of the examples um, of of bird-friendly buildings that are not necessarily using bird-friendly glass. So it's just one of the tools in our toolbox to make buildings safer for birds. We do have a few examples in Ottawa. Of course, we'd always like to see more. Um, but the University of Ottawa STEM complex is built uh, following bird-friendly design guidelines. And they've used uh, a combination of this opaque glass and pattern glass to make a very interesting and, and uh, attractive design. Uh, so the reflections are eliminated because uh, they have the patterns or the opaque uh, glass, but it still allows natural light. It reduces glare on the inside. And like I mentioned, it's, it's a very interesting and attractive building. Place Bell is actually not a building that was built uh, following bird-friendly design standards, but when it was renovated, uh, they made it bird-friendly. And so what they did is they used pattern glass. Uh, you can't really even tell that it's patterned from a distance, uh, but this is all patterned with lines. And they used frosted glass, as you can see in the lower left here. So this building is now bird-friendly after this retrofit. And as I mentioned, it's a lot easier and more economic to make buildings bird friendly to start with, but there are methods that we can use to uh, prevent collisions at any building uh, that already exists, whether it's a large office building or a single family house. And let's go over these now and I'll focus more on what you can do at your house, uh, but a lot of these can be used at a larger scale on larger buildings. So if you have collisions, there's a few things that you can do very quickly that aren't super effective, but will help. The first is that if you have a bird feeder or bird bath, you need to make sure it's very close to your window. Uh, less than one meter is ideal. And this may seem counterintuitive, but normally when birds collide, when they're at a feeder, it's because they get startled off the feeder. And if the feeder is very close to the window, they won't be moving very quickly when they collide, and so they're less likely to be hurt. If, they're, if the feeder is further away, they'll be moving at full speed when they collide and are more likely to be killed or injured. Moving indoor plants away from windows uh, is important because a bird may see through that window and try to get to that uh, plant. And this is especially true if you have a large amounts of plants that would attract a bird. 
You can also close curtains or blinds, but as with having uh, glass patterns on the inside, if there's reflections causing the collisions, this won't help. So it only helps if the problem is uh, that the bird can see through to the other side of the house. The most important thing is to have visual markers in the glass to make the birds aware that it's there. And one of our favorites at Safe Wings is uh, a product called Feather Friendly. And for the do-it-yourself version, it comes basically like a roll of scotch tape and you apply it and then you peel it off and it leaves uh, these dots behind. And what's important to look at here is that, whoops, uh, the dots are widely spaced, but they actually only cover up about four to 5% uh, of the total window. So you still get lots of light. Window films are another effective solution. And these can be patterned like the ones on the uh, upper uh, side of this uh, slide, or they can be solid as in the bottom left. Now the bottom left looks like it's solid and it's just blocking off the window, but the middle picture shows what it looks like from the inside. Uh, and it shows, I think, a, a pole for a bird feeder there showing that it's important that this window be treated, but it still allows light uh, while preventing collisions and also increasing your privacy. Screens are great at preventing collisions, but only if they're on the outside of the window. Um, paracord is also a very sort of surprisingly effective solution. Uh, the picture on the right here shows a window that just has uh, one uh, bit of plastic or aluminum at the top and then lines of paracord at the proper spacing that are hanging down and are attached at the bottom. And this will also prevent collisions and is something that you can make for yourself and is very inexpensive. But we're really not limited as long as we follow the instructions about things being on the outside of the glass, about being a uh, high contrast color and having uh, appropriate density, you can get creative. And if you're trying to do something uh, just to test it out, you can use these liquid chalk markers to make a really, uh, really gorgeous pattern like here. And if you want something a bit more long term, you can use these oil based paint markers um, to do something like the window on the left, which has a screen on the outside in the middle section, and then these really great patterns with the oil based paint marker on either side. And as I mentioned, while these are, I was focusing mainly on ways to do this at home, these same methods can be expanded to, uh, to large projects as well. So in the upper left, you can see a building that's been retrofitted with bird-friendly glass in Ottawa. And on the right, you can see the paracord uh, at a bigger building, still hanging down and attached at the top and bottom, preventing collisions. Uh, this film on the bottom right is the same as the white one, oops, the white one uh, that was seen on that uh, single pane of glass and it allows you to see through and for light to get through from one side but not the other. And on the bottom left you may recognize uh, this glass walkway is the one that I mentioned previously from the National Gallery and this has actually been retrofitted with the dots and because it is a large structure and a bit higher off the ground than most people's home windows. You need a little bit of extra equipment, uh, but it can still be done. If you are getting new windows, bird-friendly glass is definitely one of the best solutions. It's relatively uh, inexpensive uh, compared to, um, you know, it's not that much more expensive than just normal glass. And it's uh, an attractive way to make sure you have a long-term solution. Now, what's really important if we're trying to prevent collisions at existing buildings is to listen to the science, because although we're still learning about collisions, we do know how to prevent them. And when guidelines aren't followed, we get buildings that are supposed to be bird friendly and aren't. And unfortunately, there is a prime example of that in Ottawa, and this is the National Arts Centre. And this building's major uh, renovation was designed by a architect from Toronto. 
And as I mentioned before, Toronto has mandatory bird-friendly design guidelines. So all the architects from Toronto should know how to make a building bird-friendly. And you can see the pattern here has spacing that is too wide to prevent collisions. Any smaller bird would think that they could fly between those markers and so they won't be effective. Uh, they're also on the inside of the glass, so you can't really see them uh, from the outside, and they're in a low contrast color. Uh, it's, they're kind of a beigey color, although it's, it's hard to see in this picture. And since this building uh, was renovated and supposedly bird friendly, uh, we've had 46 collisions in just 2020, including a species at risk. And because we don't think we find most of the birds who collide, even at buildings we monitor, the true number hitting this supposedly bird-friendly building is more like 300 to 450. So I thought it was also important to show a bit what doesn't work. And this includes these decals, which unfortunately are still widely sold as uh, solutions to bird collisions. And the reason they don't work is because they don't have the density needed. Uh, to prevent collisions. So a bird won't collide with this corner here because there's something here, but this decal in the corner uh, won't keep the bird from colliding in this area. Birds also don't recognize a static shape like this as a bird of prey or as a threat. So they don't keep the, uh, a bird of prey outline doesn't keep birds away. So you can use these as an effective solution, but only if you put a ton of them up and that would block your view and let in less light. So we don't recommend these. Oops. Another thing that doesn't work um, and has had some very mixed results in testing is UV uh, collision deterrence. And the theory here is that because some birds can see in the UV spectrum, if we put in UV reflectant material in the glass, uh, the birds should be able to see it and we don't. And that sounds great, but it doesn't really live up to the hype. So one of the reasons is that a lot of birds actually don't see in the UV spectrum. So those birds uh, aren't prevented from colliding. The other issue is that a lot of collisions, perhaps majority, occur in the very early morning. And uh, as other people who sunburn easily might know that uh, there's very little UV light in the morning. Uh, that's when I tend to come out in the sun in the summer. Uh, so there's very little UV light around to reflect and to show birds that there's something there. So this is why Safe Wings does not recommend uh, these products. So let's talk now, if we know the solutions, about putting them in action. So I'm gonna share a bit about what Safe Wings does, and, um, and then I'm gonna follow that up with about what you can do as an individual. So one of the, the main things that Safe Wings done is building monitoring. And this is basically volunteers going around uh, buildings during the migratory season, as sometimes the rest of the year, and looking for dead and injured birds. When we find them, we record when and where uh, the, the bird was found as well as the species. We collect uh, the dead birds and we bring the um, injured ones to a rehabber uh, so they can hopefully be helped. And this is really important for identifying problem buildings and being able to demonstrate to building owners that there's a problem. We also work with the government uh, the City of Ottawa, we work with extensively, as I mentioned before, we've uh, helped uh, with the guidelines, the bird friendly design guidelines, so that hopefully new buildings in Ottawa will be safer for birds. We also work with the Nap National Capital Commission. You might recognize the structure in the upper right here, which is the vid visitor center at Gatineau Park. And this has actually been retrofitted uh, with dots on it to prevent collisions. We also are uniquely situated uh, to be able to work with the federal government, and we've been working with organizations uh, with with departments like Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as uh, others, to make sure that the um, buildings that the government uses are bird friendly, as well as requiring that in uh, other buildings. So that's an ongoing project. Safe Wings does a lot of outreach and education. 
Uh, we were one of the main contributors to the Ottawa Bird Strategy, which is a document that basically identifies uh, the main threats facing birds in Ottawa and also identifies solutions that we can work towards to prevent these problems. We do a lot of outreach with property owners and managers, often at the buildings uh, that we monitor and we are able to show them that there's a problem and suggest solutions. We talk to architects and builders about how to make sure that new buildings are safe for birds. We have quite a lot of social media activity. Uh, we highly urge everyone to, to follow us on social media if you have it. Uh, and this is where we help to educate the public as well as share things like events like this one. We do uh, our annual bird display, or at least we normally do when uh, people can meet and we're, we're looking at ways to, to do that safely this year as well. And we've led things like a Jane's Walk, showing buildings that are dangerous and buildings that are safe for birds uh, in the downtown area. We also do lots of outreach with school and community groups. So we're basically trying to raise awareness about both the problem and the solutions. You may know about our Safe Wings hotline. Uh, this is a number that people can call if they have questions or if they have an injured or dead bird. So we can provide information about preventing collisions or what people can do if they find an injured bird. Uh, we can also often give it um, assistance, although we are entirely volunteer run. So it really depends on if we have enough people available. Uh, in the upper right here, we have two of us here. You, you don't actually see the bird in this picture, but we did capture a, a Canada goose um, on the parkway with a broken wing. We've worked with some really great arborists who have helped with birds who are stuck uh, in trees, usually with entanglements, um, or helped reunite birds with their parents after they've fallen out of the nest. We also have two volunteers that run, uh, that are licensed rehabilitators and run uh, short-term care rehab facilities out of their houses. As you might expect, we are window collision specialists, and this is because window collision victims do require some specialized care. Uh, so it's similar to having a, a concussion in a human, and one of the main things that we can offer them is oxygen enriched areas, and this helps them uh, to basically get the oxygen that they need while they're recovering. And we can also just give them a supportive environment where they have adequate food um, and, and they're protected from predators and scavengers. And we work with the Wild Bird Care Center in Ottawa as well as other facilities when we have uh, patients that need longer term care. And you can see from the pictures here that we get everything uh, from a morning warbler on the, on the lower left to a pileated woodpecker and a chimney swift. And so we get a huge diversity of birds coming through and we have a really high success rate um, in, in helping them out. All right, so that's what Safe Wings is doing to help birds, but what about people as individuals? What can they do? Now, the most important thing perhaps is to treat your windows or your railings. Uh, we offer uh, Feather Friendly, as I, I mentioned before, is a great product. Uh, we offer that for sale as do uh, many other retailers such as Wild Birds Unlimited, and you can also buy it online. Uh, so this is a really effective way. You can also use homemade uh, uh, methods like the, the paracord on the left there and our website has a lot of information about how to do this effectively. You may not be in a situation where you can make changes to your building, whether it be your, your home or your office, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't help birds. It's really important uh, to know if there's a problem, so monitoring for collisions, whether at your home or your work or your school is really important and can be a really good excuse to go for a, a short walk every once in a while. Any collisions you find can be reported on our website. So we have an uh, awareness of what buildings may be a problem. And you can also talk to your uh, building manager or condo board or other management 
if you do discover that there is a problem. And Safe Wings can help both with information and background if you're speaking uh, to building management, as well as supplies and information about monitoring um, buildings. Sharing your knowledge is really important. I am just amazed now, now that people I know tend to be aware that I, I work with collisions, Everyone has a story about a collision and lots of people uh, want to know how they can prevent them. So talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, family, let them know that there are solutions and send them to our website. Uh, you know, we can make sure to spread the word amongst everyone so that people know that there's, there's solutions. You can also advocate for bird friendly building design. This is really important um, and we need more widespread support for this. Uh, talking to elected officials, uh, as well as when we have these community consultations, when there's new developments, attending those and asking, what are you doing here to protect birds? That's really important. If you have friends who are architects or builders, share what you've learned tonight, uh, direct them to Safe Wings website. We need to make sure that everyone who is making new buildings is aware of this problem. One of the ways, if you're, if you're not really sure on how to start this uh, or where to start with this is following us on social media. We often have uh, featured uh, posts about how you can help speak up for birds, such as signing a petition uh, to update Ontario's building code, or in the lower picture, we had people make comments on the US government website when they were talking about lowering protections for birds. Rescuing live birds is also super important. If you do find a live bird that's injured, don't hesitate because birds are scavenged very quickly or they may manage to fly away just enough so you can't find them again. You can gently pick up a bird and put it in a box or a bag and then uh, give us a call for further instruction. If it's something bigger, uh, you can use a towel or a blanket to throw over it and put it in a bigger box. Um, but it's important, no matter what the bird, that you don't handle it more than you need to. Um, and this is, is really important because people tend to like peeking into the box or taking a picture, um, but stress can actually kill birds. So, so once it's in a box, give us a call and, and make sure you leave it somewhere quiet and warm and dark. And don't be afraid of birds as well. A lot of people are afraid of birds, but unless you happen to find an injured eagle or great blue heron, they really can't hurt you. And this, if, if you take nothing else home from this presentation, I, I hope you remember this. We get this so often. Someone who has found a bird that has collided, they've put it in its box and we're giving them instructions on, on to bring it to a rehabber and they say, well, you know, it seems fine now, can I just let it go? And the answer is a resounding no, because birds that have major injuries can still fly sometimes, and some injuries take a long time to show up. And I'll give you two examples. The bird on the lower left there is a brown creeper, which is a tiny little bird, about 10 grams, and they actually, some of them overwinter in Ottawa, which is amazing. But we had, one of our rehabbers had a brown creeper, and it seemed fine the day after the collision, except for it seemed a bit puffy. And she looked more closely at it and found that it was actually inflating a bit like a balloon. And this is because it had punctured an air sac, which is sort of a, a bird equivalent of a lung, when it collided and every breath it took uh, let a little bit more air under its skin. So this bird actually had to be deflated multiple times by our rehabber, and if it had been released after it collided, it would have definitely died. The other example is this pine grosbeak on the lower right here. And this is a bird who collided and seemed lively and, and okay uh, shortly after, and then the next day showed this blood in the eye. So if this bird had been released after it collided, it would be out there uh, trying to survive uh, blind in one eye. So this is why we tell people birds who collide always need to get to a rehabber if possible. Now that uh, collecting uh, injured bird is important, but so is collecting a dead bird. 
And this is because finding these dead birds and knowing where they came from is really important for us to be able to determine which buildings are a problem and to be able to demonstrate to building management that there is a problem. So if you do find a dead bird, uh, retrieve it immediately. Again, there's so many scavengers, it's amazing how fast uh, things can come and grab a dead or injured bird. And put it in a bag, give us a call. Sometimes you may not be able to take it with you, in which case try hiding it and let us know where it is. Or, you know, at the very least, take a picture because that's better than nothing. It is always better for us to have the actual specimen. Uh, sometimes when you're trying to ID a bird, it's very helpful to have more than a picture to actually have the bird, but it still, it does help. Uh, and it is low risk, just like handling live birds, just make sure uh, you wash your hands after. Now, these are things that you can do on your own, but being part of a collective is always going to be more effective. And so we're always looking for more volunteers at Safe Wings, whether it's something like a driver or a rescuer when we have injured birds or a building monitor. And you don't need to dedicate a huge amount of time. You can dedicate as much or as little time as you want, even if it's just going for a walk every day or a couple days a week and looking at a nearby building to see if there's any birds there. Once people know a bit more about collisions, uh, you can do participate in events like this, doing outreach. Um, but a lot of people sometimes have skills that they may not recognize as helpful to an organization like Safe Wings. So we really encourage people to get on our website and fill out our volunteer form. We are also an entirely uh, donation-based nonprofit organization. So if you're able to donate, that helps us as well. So Safe Wings Ottawa is helping to make Ottawa um, a, a safer place for birds. We hope that you will join us in this and save our number, look on our website and find out how you can support Safe Wings and support birds in Ottawa. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I know a lot of us are, are pretty Zoomed out. So having another hour long Zoom in the evening may not be the most uh, inviting thing, but it's great that so many people are interested in this problem and now aware of the solutions. So we welcome questions, both myself and Anouk, and yeah, I'll pass it back to the City of Ottawa staff. Thank you so much there, Willow, that was great. And uh, at this time, we would like to invite people to use that reactions function at the bottom of the Zoom window. You can use that to express your appreciation, certainly, or you can also use it to raise your hand. That is an option under the reactions tab. And um, we will be taking questions at this point for Willow and Anouk. And uh, so just raise your hand and one of our staff will unmute you and let you know when it's your turn to ask a question. And I'm seeing lots of virtual applause and thumbs up. So thank you very much. It's great to see. It was an excellent presentation. Oh, we have a hand up. And remember that uh, again, Willow is bilingual. If you want to ask your question in French or English, we can accommodate. Uh, so Pam, you're unmuted. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, the new public library that they have planned down in Le Breton Flats looks like it has tons of glass and lots of plants, and has that been designed as bird friendly? So that's a complicated answer. Um, and I, I might say a couple words and then pass this one to Anouk because she's been more involved with the library than I have. They say it will be bird friendly and there's plans to use bird friendly glass, but there are aspects of it that still concern us at Safe Wings. So maybe Anouk can expand on that. Yeah, so one of our concerns is that light pollution, as far as we know, hasn't been addressed. Um, and we know designs are changing and stuff and we have seen some improvements from the earlier ones, uh, but we expect light pollution to be a problem there. 
uh, unless you know there's shades installed or some kind of system to reduce the light overnight. But because it's a, a public space that would be used at night, um, we're concerned that it will be lit up quite brightly at night. The other thing is that in general, it just has areas with a lot of glass, especially on the, on the upper floors. So even with bird friendly glass, it could still be a bit of an issue. Um, I mean, it's better to have bird, bird safe glass, uh, but you know, usually the best place to start with making a building bird friendly is to just reduce the amount of glass that's that's unnecessary. Um, so, you know, we're, we're hoping that it will be bird safe. Um, it will certainly be better than the National Arts Centre. Uh, I'm pretty confident about that. Okay, thank you. That's, that's not necessarily a high bar enough, given what we've just heard. <laughs> <laughs> but but I will say that you know from the very beginning we have shared the the Ottawa's guidelines uh, in draft form with the library design team and we've continued to keep them updated and apprised of the progress of the guidelines right up to their approval by City Council last November. So they are fully aware of the guidelines and and they have engaged with Safe Wings to try to improve on that design. I did also have a, a question in um, a chat, a direct chat to me, um, it, asking whether clean windows are worse than dirty ones. In general, yes. Anything that uh, anything that makes a window more transparent or makes reflections look more real uh, will increase collisions. However, well having a dirty window may lower collisions, it's not going to be as effective as, as one of the solutions we outlined. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, sorry, unmute Piero. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. It was fantastic. I really appreciate it. I especially appreciate it that you've given me an excuse not to wash my windows. But I wanted to ask about um, the record, the, the, this presentation, will it be recorded because uh, part of a community here that would be very interested in, in this, I, I, sorry, I see it is recorded, will it be made available to participants so that we can share it with others who might be interested in this? The recording will be posted on the city's YouTube channel. I can't give you an exact time because uh, we do need to make sure that we get captions produced to make it fully accessible for people. So that can sometimes take time, uh, but yes, it will be made available via the city's YouTube channel along with the previous two wildlife speaker series events that we've had. And when that happens, we'll make sure to announce it on, on SafeWing social media. So if you follow, follow us, uh, we'll, we'll try and keep everyone up to date with that. I'm not seeing any other hands up. You've covered all of the issues so well. <laughs> well, I will say that if anyone has has questions specific about you know their own home uh, or or how to best treat their own windows, uh, please feel free to reach out to Safe Wings, and we can often help uh, with that. Similarly, if you know of an area that has lots of collisions and you want to approach the building management, um, we can help with that. So definitely feel free to get in touch, um, questions, concerns like that, so. Okay, I'm seeing um, one person suggesting that the question function is not working for them. So that's unfortunate. Um, Again, you know, folks have managed to type questions directly to Willow as the presenter or to, you know, you can also type it to one of the City of Ottawa staff. Um, we have seen some folks able to use the reactions tab at the bottom of the screen. So if you just hover over the bottom, you know, the bottom part of your Zoom window, then you should be able to see the, uh, the reactions tab down there. Oh, there's a question. Someone's got their hand up. Karen, you should be good. Hi there, thank you. I'll ask a quick question. Um, 
So I guess what I'm wondering is if I want to do a do it myself project and get some of these stickers for my windows, um, you know, with a two story house, it'll be tricky for me to apply them on my own to the second story windows. Is it like if all I can do is my first story windows, is that, you know, better than nothing or just wanted to get your thoughts on that? Certainly treating, treating any window is better than nothing. Um, and people often have an idea of which buildings, or sorry, which windows uh, in a building are the worst. So you may have noticed collisions at, at one or two and, and not at others. So those would certainly be the priority ones. Um, having, we tend to hear about collisions less on the second story simply because there's often less there to reflect. So it sort of depends on what's around. Um, you can still have collisions on a second story all, all the way up, you know, to fourth or fifth story. Uh, but definitely starting with, with known problem windows is the best. And, and if you do have collisions on your upper windows, looking into a way to get up there would be maybe a, a something to do later on. Uh, I, I don't know, Anouk, do you have anything yeah, to add? I, can add that. Uh, I actually did most of the second windows on our house, second floor windows. Um, it required a ladder, an extension ladder and good balance and some patience. Um, but I was able to do it. And I have heard of other people who've been able to treat windows from the inside of the house. So if you have, say, casement windows that, that flip down, you know, for so you can clean the outsides of them, some people have those or, um, I mean, I guess those are sorry, sorry double hung windows, um, casement windows, sometimes you can you can reach out to be able to do it. Uh, somebody, I think Ted Chesky from Nature Canada actually did a video of, of him putting Feather Friendly on his own windows from the inside of the house. So it's possible. And the other thing is to hire somebody who, um, who can do it for you. We've been trying to put together a list of people, uh, you know, handy, handy person type people who might be able to take on that stuff. We haven't found people specifically to do that, but if you ask around, you know, window washers might be another option uh, who would be willing to go up there and, and do that sort of thing. I'll, I'll just add that I've recently been getting quotes myself to have Feather Friendly installed here at the house. Um, we're, we're only looking at doing some of our larger windows on the first floor, but I did discuss the possibility of doing upper story windows. There are contractors who are able to do that here in Ottawa. The, the people that I contacted were both 3M dealers locally, so they are out there. If you uh, if you look up you know feather friendly and, and look for local dealers then you can yeah. probably find someone to give you a quote. Yeah, if I can also just add uh, what I also did on a couple of the windows on the second floor that I couldn't reach as easily. I made one of those paracord uh, systems to hang in front of those, and I was able to attach those uh, much more easily with um, with industrial strength Velcro to the outside of the uh, of the window. So that's, it, just, it, it requires a lot less time to install it. So it's a lot easier. Yeah, and we're, we're working on getting that list of uh, installers on our website. I, I also do have a couple questions uh, in my chat. So I might go ahead and answer those. Uh, someone asking what defines the species at risk and what are some of the ones we've seen in Ottawa? Uh, so a species at risk is a designation either from the provincial or the federal government and they look at things like how many uh, of that species is estimated to be in Canada, whether it's a, a small population and whether it's been declining rapidly. And so these, these species have extra protection under the law. So most of the species in Ottawa are protected under, under various laws, but the Species at Risk Act gives extra protection to uh, birds that are designated as species at risk. Uh, we've had, uh, I don't know if I can offhand name all 14. Um, but You've had Chimney Swift, we saw that in the presentation, and that, yeah, that was a species have. at risk. Chimney Swift, uh, Barn Swallow, Olive Sided Flycatcher, Evening Gross Speak. Uh, falcon. Yep. Wood Thrush, Canada Warbler, Golden Winged Warbler, Eastern Wood Peewee. Um, what else are we missing? Common Nighthawk. Oh yeah, whippoorwill. Yeah. Common night hawk. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So lo lots of those. And then the second one, second question we have 
Uh, will the NAC do anything to retrofit their windows to prevent collisions? Uh, Anouk, I'll let you take this one as, as you've been dealing with them. Sorry, can you repeat that again? Will the NAC do anything to refret, retrofit their windows? Um, I hope they will. Uh, we've been working on that. Um, they haven't done anything yet, uh, which is unfortunate. I, um, we already have a bird this year that, uh, that collided there um, that, we, that we know of. Um, we've been trying to convince them because there are different options they could use. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good lesson that you have to do it right in the first place uh, to make sure your building is bird friendly. And it's a lot easier to do it when you're planning the building rather than to try to retrofit after the fact, um, you know, just uh, maintenance wise and also budget wise. Uh, so, you know, please everybody do encourage them to take action. And one, one thing I'll add to that as well is that we've actually had, we've found that them, them not following the guidelines and not doing it effectively has caused pushback with other developers who say, well, they spent all this money to make it bird friendly and it doesn't even work. Uh, and so why should, why should we do that? And we try and explain that they didn't follow the guidelines and so we wouldn't expect what they did to work, but uh, we, we definitely have heard from other developers, you know, that they don't want to try because this, this one didn't work. We, we do encourage anybody who's planning to build something to be bird safe to run it by us because we're happy to look at uh, plans and to give our feedback on how effective we think it's going to be. Yeah, there's no, you don't want to waste a whole bunch of money on a solution that we could have told you from the beginning isn't going to work. So that is, that is definitely in all of this. We were happy to, to provide advice for free. Thank you. I think it's Ishmael's turn. He's been waiting patiently. Yes. Oh, he's still on mute though. If I wanted to uh, buy one of the DIY projects, uh, where could I buy them? Um, so, oh. <laughs> I'll take that. Um, you, can, you can contact uh, Safe Wings. Um, you can find our contact information at safewings.ca. Uh, or you can go online to, uh, to Feather Friendly. It's, uh, I think it's featherfriendly.com. And they have information there on ordering it online. Thanks. So we just have uh, a question here. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, can we have an idea of cost of installing the feather option? And then when we can, when we clean our windows, does it peel away or damage the dots? Yeah, so, um, you know, cost is always going to uh, feature in people's decisions. For a roll of Feather Friendly, it's about $20. Uh, we do also send them, sell them as three packs if you're doing larger areas, which are a bit cheaper per roll. And that does an area about the size of a sliding glass door, so like a, a double glass door. Um, so it doesn't, they, they actually last quite a long time. There's buildings that have had this applied uh, for over 10 years in Toronto and they're, they're still looking good. And if by chance you do have one of the dots that, that falls off, I just keep the, the ends of the rolls that I have and you can replace them. So yeah, it's for, for doing it yourself, it's, um, it's not too expensive and there are other options like with the, the oil paint marker or the paracord that are certainly much cheaper. Um, installing this at a commercial level, so on big, bigger buildings tends to be much more costly, but that tends to be uh, because of the labor and, and often if they need a lift to get up to higher areas. I just want to clarify, a single roll of Feather Friendly will do 16 square feet and that's actually equivalent to a single patio door or a standard, you know, like your front door if it were all glass, just to clarify. Thank you, we have another question. Um, if you use the ink to draw on the outside of the windows, will it remain after cleaning the windows? Uh, if you're using an oil-based paint marker or um, any kind of oil-based paint, it will be 
I mean, you'd be able to scrape it off, but it won't come off easily. If you use something like a chalk marker or tempera paint, uh, then it will come off more easily. It will probably wear off with the weather uh, and you'd be able to wash it off more easily. I had a, a comment here just about, um, you know, important to remember your house, but also your cottage. A lot of people have cottages. They tend to be in areas with more vegetation, maybe some more birds. So this is also something uh, to, to consider for your cottage as well. Uh, I'm sure screens are very valuable uh, in a lot of those places. So having an, an exterior screen is a, a great way to make a cabin bird friendly and to prevent bugs. Mm -hmm. And just think of, you know, because we know the problem with scavenging with birds that collide or get getting preyed on, um, often people don't realize how many birds are dying at the cottage when they're not there. And I remember talking to somebody who said that, oh yeah, every spring they would open up the cottage and they would find that the big picture window was broken because a grouse would have gone through it. And you think, well, if that happens every year, <laughs> do something about it. But I mean, the only reason they knew about the collisions is because a grouse is a big enough bird that it can break a window. Thank you very much. Those were some great questions and uh, some, you know, very helpful responses. Um, if we don't have any more questions, then I think we will give another round of applause, whether that's, you know, in person or virtual, feel free either way. Uh, thank you very, very much to Willow and to Anouk for being with us tonight and providing this excellent presentation. And uh, we've, we've really appreciated it. And I look forward to getting it up on the YouTube channel and seeing how many more views we can get up there. We had uh, close to 100 people here tonight watching live, which is excellent numbers. And uh, you know, certainly a topic that hits close to home for many of us. Um, and, and especially over the past year, I think people have been noticing the issue more when they've been working from home if they weren't before. Um, you know, I, I know that I personally did hear at least one bird hit in my window when I was working here in my home this past year, and it did inspire me to, you know, put some actions behind the, uh, the city's guidelines that I was involved with bringing forward and, and make sure that they actually get applied here at home as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.